I'll take a moment and thank everybody uh, for attending. This is usually the one of my favorite events of the fall, not just because I get to talk a lot, which is what I try to narrow down, but this is typically when we get to showcase our culinary and baking and pastries and, and just an unbelievable spread uh, of food. But more importantly, I like to talk about all of the great things that are happening at the college. So uh, although we don't have that great spread put out for you tonight, you can just imagine how great that food is. And uh, you know, I'm sure afterwards when you have a nice meal, just pretend that we made that for you. Uh, from our students. But uh, my apologies, we can't all be in person. But uh, I do want to just take a moment and welcome you all and, and thank you for taking the time and, and more than anything for being uh, invested in, in the great things that are happening here at White Mountains Community College. Uh, before I do, I do dive in, I wanted to take a moment, I'm going to try to do this and look through all the boxes here and uh, acknowledge our elected officials that are taking the time out to, to be with us this evening. Uh, first of all, at the federal level, congressional uh, Chuck Henderson, on behalf of Senator Shaheen, thanks for taking the time and being here. Uh, Brian Bresnahan, on behalf of Andy McLean Custer. I want to look and see if Ben Belanger did come through or not. As I zoom through, thanks he's to out, Ben. He's out hunting this week on vacation. He is, okay, all right. Well, we will, we will let him have that. I'm sure he deserves a vacation. Uh, I just saw the photo of new Senator Aaron Hennessy. Thanks for being here, appreciate that. My pleasure. Uh, there you are. And uh, <laughs> Representative Laflamme, Representative Troy Murner's here, working my way left to right. Gretchen, this is where you yell at me if I've missed anyone. Okay, if I haven't said anything, please let me know. But I'd like to just thank those folks. You know, these are the people that, uh, you know, are always working hard for us when, you know, that we're not right there in front of them. They're down in Concord. They're at the federal level. And, and Brian and Chuck, I know, especially because I've been on regular calls with them continuously are having meetings uh, on trying to get things done at the federal level. And in a moment, when I, when I show you our, our presentation, you'll see just what some of that CARES Act money and what at the state level the gopher money has done. And I know a lot of these folks uh, have been engaged in that because I've, I've heard from you along the way. So what I'd like to do is I'm gonna ask Colby, go ahead and put that presentation up. And what my thought is here for the next 56 minutes, I, I try to keep this less than an hour. Uh, I wanna just give you some updates from a variety of areas within the college uh, from, a, from a high level, uh, certainly allow time for questions, but more importantly, I also want to then turn it over to allow uh, one of our guests this evening, Matt Wallace, with one of our uh, academic department chairs, Robin Scott, to talk about our, our North Country Teacher Certification Program. It's been a great collaboration, and I will call it uh, mature at this point, to the point where it's, we're, we're making minor tweaks, and it's just been a great partnership. So uh, with all of that said, I'm going to start and go through, and I will... Uh, you know, allow if folks want to put things in the chat box, if you have questions along the way, I'll be monitoring that as well as uh, Colby, if you don't mind, just kind of keeping me honest there a little bit as well. So with that said, I'm going to talk about student success and I'm going to try to not read slides. This is like death by Zoom is reading slides. So I'm not going to read slides. I will put them up. I also realize we sent these out in advance, but this is the overview. These are the areas we plan to touch on tonight. And if, again, at any time you say, hey, well, you didn't talk about this, put it in the box or, or feel free to raise your hand, or if you want me to elaborate on something, I'm happy to do so. Uh, and before I do dive in, uh, I am gonna talk about some faculty highlights, some things our staff have done, and just recognizing that our faculty and staff, a lot of those folks are on this call. So I would be remiss if I didn't start right away by thanking our entire college community because you know, the 2020 has been crazy, right? It's been wild. But I will also say on the other side of that, there have been some very cool things that have happened. Our, our faculty and our staff have truly stepped up to make sure that we can be in operation and still deliver this high quality education for our students. So I wanna come right out of the gate and just thanks folks for that and, uh, and, and kind of continue along the way here. So first and foremost, uh, why we do what we do, right? So uh, at the bottom here, you see in September, we had a successful commencement. We had a face-to-face -face commencement. There are very few colleges and universities that can say that in 2020. Uh, and this took a lot of planning and extra uh, spacing out of chairs and uh, just the extra planning from our maintenance facilities, Steve. Uh, but really that commencement, I'm gonna work backwards up. You know, 
crossing that stage to do so requires students to be retained. How do students get retained? It is that wraparound support services. And just, I want, I want you to draw your attention to the comparison of where our students are compared to the rest of New Hampshire, New England, and of course the US. So retention rate, which means students that were here last fall are back this fall. Almost 70% of those students are back, comparing against New Hampshire, New England, and the US. And then our graduation rate, which is 49%, you know, you'll see the same comparisons there. The asterisk there in the US, we are number 20 out of 851 two-year public colleges in the US. That's pretty impressive. And that's, you know, it goes right to, back to the faculty and staff I was just talking about, of making sure our students are successful. Uh, and that's what ultimately gets to that uh, graduation rate. So that's something we're very proud of. And that's something we continue to, uh, uh, you know, answer questions about how we get there, and it's about our faculty and staff, hands down. Uh, enrollment, you know, you've probably heard a ton about this throughout the pandemic of, you know, college enrollment is down, community college enrollment nationally is down. Uh, so we thought we would just give you a quick snapshot. You know, White Mountains, we were actually, we've been very fortunate. We're down 2.8% as far as students go. We've got 18 less students here this fall than we had last fall. That is not a, a major deal. That's something if we had, if you had asked me back in March and April when the pandemic was starting, if I'd be happy with that, I would be super excited. Uh, the difference with this is you, you'll see in the credits, we have more part-time students. Our students are taking fewer credits. And I chalk that up to uncertainty. Please don't you know, keep track of how many times I say uncertainty during the presentation. But uncertainty in that some students don't know if they're going to have hours to be working. Some students don't know if their children might be home and they've got to do remote teaching. Uh, they don't know if they can come face to face. So it might be one online class instead of coming to school one time. So they're taking less classes. But I want you to see you know, what's happening across the community college system of New Hampshire. So these are all our counterparts. Uh, we're leading the way in both areas. So uh, this for me is, uh, you know, is a win. Uh, you will see later in the presentation when I talk about finances, we budgeted to be down much more than this, which is what's helping us uh, quite a lot at this moment. So let me, uh, I'm going to pause there because I did just see Representative Egan chime in. I wanted to thank him for being here as well. Good to see you, who selfishly is also an adjunct for us, so I can say that. I'm fresh out of the class at PAC Solutions, the business class from two to five, so I got here as soon as I could, and I do have to disappear but I'm listening in for a bit but thank you for having me and thank you for letting me teach for you and thank you for letting me represent you and uh, your colleagues in the House of Representatives it's my esteemed pleasure well thank you and we're going to be using that example a little later over at PAC Solutions which I know uh, Representative Murner was just saying uh, you know invest more over in that area and I'm going to give you an example in just a moment so COVID updates this is uh, I'd love to say this is just one slide we're going to breeze over it I will try to summarize as quickly as possible, but this is where we spent literally all of our time from March, April, May, June. Uh, and I think I, I define it by three cultures. There was a culture before the pandemic. We had what our everyday average typical life was like. Then there was this shakeup of March, okay, we're going remote. We were in scramble mode of how do we make sure we have everything possible for students to do what they need to do for our faculty to have the resources, to have full staff remote operations really up to and through May. Uh, following that, uh, you know, we really said, okay, now we've got to focus on our reopening. What does reopening look like? And if you'll recall, you know, there were uh, differences among K-12, colleges and universities, people were all over the place from hunting to say, hey, we're gonna start in October or November to some schools even within our state says, we're going 100% online for the fall and just kind of said, that's the way we're going. Uh, from a programming standpoint, that would be extremely difficult for us because we have so many hands-on technical programs. So we truly tried to prioritize our technical lab-based programs. And the other side of this, which was probably a surprise for some people, but if you read data, it wasn't, we prioritized bringing first year freshmen on campus. We had to have those students on campus. This is when they're the most vulnerable. It's important for them to make connections with their faculty and with support services. So we really have prioritized that. And fast forward, we got through the first nine weeks of the semester uh, before we had to make a shift. Uh, I do want to credit our task force. We have, a, we call it our, it was a reopening task force. Now it's a COVID task force because we're reopened, but we're still using them. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, Kristen Miller, our Vice President of Academic Affairs, was engaged in what those different modalities from hybrid to face-to-face -to, -face to high flex uh, and everything in between, she was uh, heavily engaged there as well. I will say on week 10, uh, which was really that the week leading up to Halloween, there was a spike in cases in Coas County. We learned of some other uh, close contacts, if you will, uh, and we, we ended up shifting remote for the following week, the first week of November. What we did is we, we had a phase of, you know, we were green to start with, we were up and running. We are now in the orange phase, uh, where most K-12s have uh, basically just the green, red, yellow. We added an orange phase, which is, allows us to be able to customize and say, okay, some of the technical programs that are face-to-face -face can be in, but we're gonna keep some of the other lecture and theory-based courses out, and also a couple of the other uh, lab courses that have great online technology where the quality would not drop, we're keeping those out as well. So having that balance, uh, and that is the phase we're currently in. So we're, we've got some face-to-face -face going right now, somewhere between eight and 9% of our students across the three locations are still coming face-to-face, -face, and we've even thinned out the volume some, for example, uh, in our welding program, rather than having all 30 students here on the same day, some half of them are Monday, Tuesday, the other half are Wednesday, Thursday. So we've really kind of thinned out the volume uh, in, the, uh, in the buildings altogether. Uh, we've learned a lot throughout this process. You know, we continue every single week to learn more and more. Uh, Melanie Robbins, who chairs our uh, task force, you know, this is something they meet on a weekly basis. Every Tuesday at nine o'clock, we're just saying, hey, here's something else for you to review. Right now, it is a uh, review of what post Thanksgiving through January 18th looks like week by week in a granular fashion, including what our staffing levels are like, uh, what access to our facilities looks like. So we're really getting extremely granular. We're learning these lessons along the way because the more specific we are, the earlier any kind of tracking or tracing, it just makes it easier for us. Uh, and then it's spring 2021. What are we doing for January reopening? Uh, in a perfect world, in January, we're opening the same way we just did in September, prioritizing again those technical lab-based programs, but also hopefully those first-year students, lecture and theory courses can be happening. We're watching cases. Uh, but I think we've built a level of trust with our community, both, and I say community, the White Mountains Community College, our interior community, but also uh, exterior, which I want to talk about in just a moment. I feel like we've built a level of trust where, you know, I don't know that there's the expe expectation right now that, geez, Chuck, you know, the leadership team, can you tell us what we're going to be doing in January? We've gotten to the point where we're saying essentially week to week, we are going to communicate. We're going to be 100% transparent Thursday afternoons. We, we are telling our students, our faculty and staff, what the following week operations are going to look like. That for us is the best way to have current data, use multiple measures, and make the communication come out and allow basically the rest of Thursday and Friday to figure out any minute details that need to be. Uh, factoring in there, there are several case-by-case -case scenarios, uh, but I think we've built a certain level of trust within our community that, you know, if we say, this is what we're doing for next week, and someone says, well, have you thought of this? We welcome that. We welcome this. You know, this is the first time any of us have managed through a pandemic. So uh, if we're going to make a mistake or get something wrong, you know, we're all in this together to make that decision. But as far as on a week by week basis, uh, that's where we are. It allows us with these phases to pivot back and forth almost seamlessly, frankly. Uh, having that reopening plan established in advance allowed us to say, okay, orange phase, let's go ahead. We were ready for that. Uh, and if we are able to swing back to green phase for, for January, all the better. Uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, internal versus external. External, we have a group of community leaders, which some of those folks are on this call. I just want to acknowledge them as well. We meet literally every day at four o'clock. We talk about all things from what's happening in Berlin at both of the prisons to Coas County Family Health to at AVH. What are numbers like? What are test, what's testing like? Chuck Henderson and, and Brian Bresnahan, you're part of that group. Ben Belanger typically is. Uh, K-12, uh, I don't know if I saw Julie and, and Dave, uh, local superintendents from Berlin and Gorham, respectively. I mean, literally, we're talking every single day just to talk about practices, how we can be, you know, learning from each other, what are we, you know, what hurdles are we finding as well. Uh, and shout out to Dave and Julie. Every Monday morning at 1030, we also talk. We are trying to be in lockstep because the other thing is when they swing remote or if I was just to swing remote, we impact each other. 
being in a community like this, you know, if, if my faculty and staff now have children who are at home, that impacts our operations as well. So uh, just understanding the, the interrelationship there uh, and the communication ongoing. Uh, when we did shift remote uh, back in March, you know, I mentioned it was a scramble. Uh, the, the neat thing for us is we already had, you know, arguably one of the best online uh, learning formats, learning management systems in Canvas. So that was already there. We were used to using Zoom technology. I tell people we were using Zoom before it was cool. You know, if, if we have a course in North Conway, we have people that are Zooming from Littleton or Berlin or vice versa. So we were using this technology. The, the neat thing that happened is we were able to use more of it. So everything we had, we really just had to sort of scale up and train and educate others who had it. This goes for our student services as well. I know some of our folks are on here. I saw Sylvie earlier, you know, taking all of the services we're offering and saying, okay, we've got the technology, we have great services. How do we just make sure that we're setting, whether it's appointments with individuals, uh, doing things over Zoom and FaceTime, and you can see students on their cell phones using FaceTime. This was something that, you know, to me, I don't wanna say it was seamless, that would, that would be an oversight, but it went rather smoothly, just hearing from students, from, from faculty and staff of how it's gone. Uh, and this happened for all of our operations, recruitment and admissions. Uh, we, as a system, get an app. So students had an app they could download if they wanted a platform for e-counseling. And this has got some real usage out of it, which is great. This is one of those silver linings, to use the term, is you know, post-COVID, this is probably an app we keep. I think it adds a lot of access to counseling services for our students to have an on-demand counselor 24-7. Uh, you know, when we were getting into August, you know, we have all these services remote, so geez, if we're gonna be bringing students back on campus, we need to slowly ease in uh, to, to getting people comfortable on campus again. So uh, Mark Damaris, our Vice President of Student Affairs and his team said, what if we started bringing in groups, instead of these big orientations we typically do, what if we bring groups in just by their program? So now you're talking about, you know, 10, dozen, 15 students at a time. And we had, a, you know, we have our biggest classroom, room 102, where our nursing faculty typically teach. We brought in one program at a time. We did their IDs. We showed them more importantly, what it feels like to come back to college in the fall, because it was completely different. We're wearing masks, we're getting screened, taking temperatures, filling out forms, socially distanced along the way with signage. Uh, and the other piece I want to do is, you know, ask, uh, thank Scott Fields, our CFO. We also put a giant 10 by 20 tent on the, on the back uh, uh, lawn back when it was a little warmer out. And, uh, you know, we had some events out there, meetings, luncheons, but also our faculty into the fall started using that to teach outside under the tent as well. Uh, so it, it really speaks to the accessibility, but we had to do things differently. And, you know, again, our faculty and our staff, our entire team has, uh, has adapted. Uh, throughout the way, I, you know, I, I keep talking about delivering this high quality education. And the reason it's high quality is because our faculty are high quality. I'm not going to read through these, but we thought we'd put a couple of snapshots here of just what some of our faculty all throughout this process were doing, whether it was writing poems, getting additional certifications, completing degrees, being industry recognized. These are our high quality faculty. So here's, uh, here are just some of them here. A special shout out, I know Robin is on here. I don't know if I saw John. Uh, and then the next group, Matthew Johnson, who's uh, he's one of our, uh, our adjuncts. I think that CAGS is from Plymouth, if I remember correctly, Matt, just FYI there. Uh, and of course, John Holt on that uh, Governor's Advisory Council. So these are our high quality faculty. I thought I would just point that out. It's always, it's bragging rights, right? I mean, these are the people that are spending the time with our students. Uh, quickly, just over to our academic centers. I've referenced a couple of times, North Conway and and Littleton and the zooming back and forth we had always done before. Well, guess what? We got even more technology there. All of our, we literally have enough equipment. All of our classrooms at all three locations are Zoom classrooms, which means, you know, you can stand, there are cameras all around, there is audio, it is the top quality. And Scott did a lot of the system-wide purchasing and, and shopping to make sure we had the best of the best. And I will tell you, this is high quality. Uh, and to me, this is, I'll show you in a little bit where all the money went. This is where a chunk of our money went. This is stuff where we probably would have purchased 10 years down the road. We did all of that buying and installation over the course of the summer. I know Tammy is on here from IT. This was a lot of work to turn around and be ready literally up until the last day uh, before classes started. Uh, part of our capital budget the last time through the state of New Hampshire, thanks to all of our elected officials, we had some new CDT trucks, our, our commercial driver training program. 
Uh, anyone that's been by our Littleton facility, we've got some new trucks over there. And that program has been growing. It turns out, you know, when you're ordering millions of things online, they need to be shipped. So if everyone's looking for drivers, uh, and, and that to me is, you know, we're, we're trying, we can't keep up with the demand for the drivers there. We're actually in the process, uh, Matt Malkin, our new director of marketing and communications, is looking at branding the trucks more carefully. We've got a red one, a, a green one, a yellow one, a gray one, and we're going to get them all the same color, put our logo on them, and, and a special thanks to, you know, once again, to all of our elected officials for uh, their ongoing support there. Uh, and then, you know, the, the in-person and remote balance back and forth, I would say the academic centers, they, they've been doing this before the pandemic. I always say they were doing it before it was cool. You know, phone calls, Zoom, because our students come from all different distances and, and it just it finds a way. They were the ones, the academic centers, who really were innovative around access. And that was really the reason these academic centers were designed, was to create better access. Uh, and we've also been operating some of our workforce training programs over there. I know uh, the supervision training from Nick Manolis happened over there for Genfoot and some of our other partners as well. So the academic centers have been uh, really flourishing throughout this process. Uh, additional workforce development, uh, you, can, you can read through some of this. I, I mentioned earlier, I wanted to give an example of Troy over in Lancaster, PAC Solutions. So they've been, uh, they've got a new ownership group that has just invested literally millions of dollars in equipment and machinery. They've hired more people. They have a plan. They've got 87 people. Last I spoke to him, you may have a better number now. 87 people. My guess is they're trying to get to the 125, 130 employees, which is a good size outfit for right in Lancaster. But these people who are just hard workers, good people, are being promoted into managerial roles. And now they need the training to be managers, to be supervisors. Uh, and that's really what's keeping them from expanding at this moment into a third shift. So we went over literally three weeks in a row. Week one was, tell us your needs. Week two was, we're going to customize a program for you. And week three was really an audit, bringing uh, Kristen Miller over and a couple of other folks. Uh, Tamara Rovers really has spearheaded this whole piece. Uh, what we did is we went over and said, okay, let's individually audit each of your employees. So we're gonna send a total of 21 people through this, seven at a time. Kristen sat with them one-on-one -on -one and Tamara and said, okay, what do you have for training already? What have you done for any credit coursework? Somebody had some from VTC they're bringing. Someone did some non-credit types of training, supervision training, bring us that. All the way to somebody has a master's degree. So we're finding out where they are on the spectrum, what their goals are. Do you want a certificate, associate degree? What are your career goals? Really doing some real entrance counseling, if I can put it that way. And, and at the end of the day, we've got them all in a course, we've got them on a pathway, and we'll be doing a lot more of this work. So it's real truly customized work. And we see this scaling up quite a bit more. You see some of our other examples here, Industrial Mechanics uh, Memorial. These are really just customized training. Higher ed is changing. How we deliver post-secondary education is tra really changing rapidly. So a lot of this, and I didn't mention this at PAC Solutions, this is happening on site. We're doing this at PAC Solutions. You know, Memorial's apprenticeship, we're doing things out at Memorial. So the, the feel of saying everyone's gotta come to the building, it has to be a certain time and day, that's really kind of blown up and education is truly accessible uh, really out wherever you know, it, it can happen. And that's where Tim is currently is, uh, you know, working with that group over there. So thanks once again, Tim, for that. Uh, and, and as I talk about facilities, you know, we have our main campus here in Berlin and I, I credit to our, our maintenance team. We've been doing small renovations, moving offices, you know, cleaning things up, retrofitting, and obviously all this technology I just talked about. Uh, across the street, we have what used to be a beautiful Victorian Twitchell house. It has not been, uh, uh, heated for five years at this point. We are going to be putting that on the market, uh, utilizing a real estate sale. Uh, special shout out if, uh, if Jim Wheeler's on, some of the storage that was there. Uh, City Manager Jim Wheeler's allowed us to, a connection with the Armory. So I work with those folks. The Armory up the road is allowing us to store things that were in the, the, the barn over there for free over the winter. So again, part of that community relationship, that's fun. Uh, and what used to be a childcare facility now becomes our uh, really workshop and storage and uh, maintenance facility as well. So it's sort of a, a shell game up here, but also uh, taking some uh, facilities and, and lack of utilities off the books to uh, really kind of right size a little bit as well and maximize what we're doing on this side of the street. 
Uh, and then North Conway, you know, remains just a, a great operation. Two years ago, we added the veterinary assistant lab over there that uh, Dr. Mary Orff is on here. That was her, uh, her brainchild that continues to flourish down there. Uh, and things are, things are going really well uh, as far as the North Conway area goes. And uh, uh, finally, Littleton is probably the area I could spend hours and hours on. I will spend just a few minutes because, uh, you know, down the road, we're going to be flushing this out. Yes, we plan to expand in Littleton. We are currently looking at our existing property on Union Street. Uh, we are looking to uh, build a, uh, I'm calling it a technology building because there is a heavy equipment technology component to it, uh, possibly uh, electrical vehicle to me, and I know we're talking on that. So there's a, there's a piece there, there's an IT piece. We're trying to come together and say, we need a facility that can house diesel heavy equipment that possibly can help us as much as possible help the building, the businesses in the area, which tend to be a lot of manufacturing built businesses uh, and also some small mom and pop type of things. So I'd like to say, say there might be an entrepreneurial arm to that as well. So we're fleshing that out. Uh, we're waiting on some approvals. Uh, so I don't want to go into too many specifics, but anyone uh, interested in knowing what we're doing, we are, I will say, aggressively pursuing uh, expanding our presence in Littleton. I'll leave it at that for the moment with more details to come down the road trying to be diplomatic on that. So I, I appreciate a little leeway there. Uh, finances. So I mentioned earlier, first and foremost, that we uh, you know, did everything we could to help students. So elected officials, thank you. This is that CARES Act money from the federal level, came to the Gopher Committee uh, at the state level, and we turned over and said, how can we help students? Some of this was uh, direct money to students, the CARES Act mini grants, to the point where we were literally you know, asking students to complete information. Scott Fields, our CFO, was saying, okay, here's another one out the door. How are we helping students? Bing, 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 instant turnaround, trying to support our students. The, the gopher side of things was really more of our technology. That is our Zoom classrooms. That is getting everything we need, uh, computers, soft phones, I mean, laptops to loan to students, hotspots. I mean, we're just trying to do whatever we can to make sure our students are successful. Uh, there was somebody here uh, drilling a hole in the wall just outside my office because we're connecting Wi-Fi, so our entire uh, outside parking lot will be Wi-Fi enabled. So we're, we're just trying to do whatever we can. So students who don't have great access at home, drive to our parking lot. We've got access here. So we're trying to do take that money, turn it right around. Uh, and you'll see some other funds here along the way. I want to you know, acknowledge our uh, foundation at the community college system. Uh, some money that really turned into direct aid, turned around into some gift cards, uh, Market Basket, Hannaford's, Walmart, those types of things to make sure students had funds, but also some gas cards as well. Uh, and other support service, uh, you know, we just got a, a Tillotson grant through the Charitable Foundation uh, to really put together, I don't want to call it a food pantry, that's a negative connotation, free food service for our students, faculty, and staff as well. Uh, as part of this. But you see that bottom line, almost a million dollars throughout this process targeted directly to students from a variety of other areas. So I, I just think that's, I mean, it's clearly from start to finish of everything I've talked about, it's about the students. It's literally about the students. Uh, and then finally, just sort of a snapshot of where we are as a college. First, when I speak to grants, I, I want to acknowledge where we are. Uh, we have uh, Northern Borders Regional Commission grant. One is uh, the, through the community college system, which is enhancing our welding program, making an accredited testing facility. We have some equipment in, we have an audit coming, we have done a manual. I mean, there's been a ton of work by our welding team and Tamara Rovers to make that happen. There is also a manufacturing component. Andy Labonte is really moving some of our programming online around manufacturing, blueprint reading and, and otherwise. Uh, and then our, our previous grant, which runs out in this uh, next coming year, was for the industrial mechanics program. We just graduated our, our first cohort from that uh, grant, which is uh, four students graduated in the summer, a little later than they typically would. It took a while to come back after uh, we went remote. But those four graduates are all, you know, they're on the working force now. And you know, to me, there are, there are jobs out there. So we're continuing to look at that program to see some non-credit in there, some credit, uh, and also you know, customized training programs. Uh, I'm not going to read this to you. The, the bottom line here financially for the college uh, is last year when we were budgeting, you know, we got to adjust our budget in March and April where there was some super unpredictability. We said, you know what, Scott and I sat down and said, 
let's present this to the leadership team. What does it look like if we're down 15%, if we're down 20% enrollment? And as a leadership team, we all came together and said, you know what? Let's be super conservative because we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, so we did. We budgeted to be down 20%. Anyone in their right mind, my typical boss would have probably fired me and thought I was crazy. Uh, but I tell you what, to be landing essentially 8.8% uh, 8, 8 down gives us some leeway. Because when we said we were going to be down 20%, we were going to be in the red about $722,000, Scott. I'm somewhere in that number, right? Am I close? And since we were only down 88 through some real fiscal uh, conservation, but also some strategic management throughout all of our faculty and staff and their spending. At this point in the middle of November, we are projected to basically break even come the end of the fiscal year. So we have made up a $722,000 deficit, essentially by management, but also projecting conservatively and coming in better than, than you know, predicted, which is really a result of our our faculty, our admissions, recruitment, and some of these customized, you know, PAC solutions types of programs that are just kind of jumping in. Uh, and the, the other piece I would say is our running start numbers are really starting to come in. Early college, more and more students are taking these courses. If they're going to be home or remote anyways, they are really starting to take these courses. So there are a lot of factors in here, but just kudos to, to my leadership team, to Scott, to our faculty and staff are really being prudent. And there are very few colleges out there that can say, you know what, we're down 8.8% this year and you know what, we're in pretty good shape. And I will also say over the last three plus years, we have built a reserve account to weather emergencies. We never knew it would be a pandemic, certainly, but to weather emergencies. And you know, we're, we're in one, but we don't anticipate having to use that this year. Were so. you gonna cook that or no? Or did you already cook it? Uh, it, is, it is not cooked, Senator, I appreciate that. If that's John cooking, give him my best. <laughs> and I, I do want to, I stayed right on my, my 32 instead of 31 minutes. I want to turn this over to, uh, and I'll take questions at the end if that's okay with folks, you know, feel free to throw them over on the side here. Uh, if, uh, if I may just turn it over to Matt Wallace, Director of Admissions at Plymouth State University, and Robin Scott is our Department Chair for Social, Behavioral, and Education. If she can, uh, you know, 15, 20 minutes, just tell us about the program, let us know, uh, you know where to go from here, and then maybe we can all just take questions uh, together as a group later on, if that works for folks. So, and I'm gonna pause you for a second. I think I did see uh, Representative Tucker come in. I'm trying to monitor all the, the magical squares here. So welcome to Edith, good to see you. And I'll, I'll look again later. Matt and Robin, all yours. Awesome, thanks. Awesome, thanks everybody. Uh, so we'll kind of give you a rundown of the, what the program looks like. Um, whoever's controlling the slides, if you don't mind jumping to the next slide. Uh, so the North Country uh, Teachers Certification Program is really a elementary education certification program that's designed to really bolster teachers in New Hampshire's North Country. Um, so it's a partnership that both of our institutions are really proud of. And, it really, there's some text on the screen, but what it really boils down to is students from White Mountains um, taking 78 credits, earning their associate's degree plus their special education certificate at White Mountains, and then um, joining Plymouth State to complete that bachelor's degree. Um, we have a pathway where we guarantee admission to these students um, and make sure that they have access and they have a very supportive pathway to completion. Jump to the next slide. Uh, and Robin, jump in uh, anywhere because you've been involved in this a lot longer than I am and you really are the heart and soul of this program. Um, but the program has really evolved over the last year um, to two years. Originally, it was a four year program. So, students did two years at White Mount Community College and then two years uh, with Plymouth State granted on the White Mountain Community College campus, but it was only offered every other year. And that really created an issue for our students who are in that off year. So you're taking a four year program and pushing it out to five years. And that has all host of challenges when you're talking about financing school and timeline to getting into the workforce. Um, so there was a real need to fix what was a flaw in the structure of a really well oiled program. Uh, and what Robin and some other folks from Plymouth State did was um, take this four to five year program that ran every other year and 
trans transition it to a three year program that runs every year. Um, so it's still that it's 78 credits at White Mountains Community College, and then they come to Plymouth and take those 42 additional credits, say to that 120 that makes up the 120 for, uh, for a bachelor's degree. They do that through some creative scheduling, right? It's an intensive three year program. Um, so they take classes summer, fall, and spring terms. There's some praxis requirements they have to do before coming to Plymouth because of how far they are through their, um, through their education. But it really is um, kind of the next level in partnership between a community college and a four-year institution. And a lot of the students like the three-year program because they're graduating from White Mountains Community College one May and then the following May through Plymouth. Mm -hmm. um, and so it gets them into the workforce quicker um, and it is accelerated. So they do have summer program courses for Plymouth as well as White Mountains between their first and second year. You can jump to the next slide. So really the benefits to the students, we've talked a little bit about this, is that they complete the bachelor's degree in three years. So that's real cost savings. Um, and when they are taking um, the 78 credits at White Mountain Community College, there's an additional cost savings from breaking out 60 to 60 as well. Um, and they're entering the workforce a year earlier. Um, we'll talk about the benefits for the state in a second, but that's a huge win for students, right? If they can get out, start earning real income in three years instead of four years, they have less debt and they're just padding their pockets much earlier. Um, and then we see some students take that traditional fourth year and get additional certifications. Um, through Plymouth, we've seen a couple students come and do the special education cert uh, one-year certification program, or some other students begin on that master's certification. Um, and getting that job earlier allows them to start using their benefits through school for that master's certification. Um, a couple, actually two other benefits I thought of that we didn't put in here um, is that when the students are coming to White Mountains, they are, very warmly welcomed by Robin and everybody at White Mountains. And then we have a shared advising model for the students moving forward. So when they come to Plymouth, um, they work with Mike Willis, who's our transfer admissions counselor from anybody coming from a CCSNH college. Um, so Robin hands them off warmly to Mike. Mike makes sure they get registered in classes, gets to the orientation, everything like that at Plymouth, and then we'll warmly hand them off to a faculty member in the um, education program. So it's making sure that there's no drops for these students, right? One of the big challenges we see with transfer enrollment is that it can be this kind of like cold handover. A lot of schools have these really robust first year advising models, but that doesn't exist in the transfer world. And we want to make sure that these students don't fall into that gap. Um, so even though they never come to Plymouth State, they get the entire benefit of being on Plymouth State's campus by having that nice warm transition. And if we can jump to the next slide. So then uh, benefits for the North Country, right? Um, Robin let me know that there's over 50 alternative certifications um, currently in the North Country. So there's a demonstrated high need for truly certified teachers. Um, so these students are getting out. They are living in the North Country, right? They didn't go somewhere else for school. They didn't leave the area. They're living in the North Country. They're going to be looking for jobs in the North Country. So there's just a robust pipeline of 10 to 12, um, hopefully 15, 20 graduates eventually um, every year going back into the North Country community um, and really increasing the, uh, the total amount of qualified um, certified teachers. Um, and this 50 alternative um, certifications, that's from like North Conway North. Um, so teachers that are currently employed in the public schools on an alternative certification through the New Hampshire Department of Ed. And then finally, what are the benefits for White Mountain Community College and PSU? Um, this is a highly desired program. Uh, Robin does a lot of work to recruit for it. Um, and students are excited, especially about that three-year program now. They're really excited that um, they can make that investment in themselves, that education really gets them. Right? We all know that education opens doors for higher income and additional growth opportunities. And they can do that in three years. Um, and I think both of our education programs are really well-respected in the community. Um, and then it also, it's 
a partnership model that is going to allow for future expansion between our institutions um, for different academic programs. Um, we have started those conversations and we're really excited to see what that brings and how we can provide this opportunity to a greater percentage of North Country students. Um, we think by opening up those doors, it will help with White Mountain enrollment in the long term, as well as PSU. And that, um, as we all know, is good for both of us. I think that is the last slide. It is. <laughs> I was just going to say thank you. First of all, you know, Matt for taking the time and joining us this evening, but you know, Rob and the amount of work you've put in. So this program, just in, in my few years here, you know, your predecessor, Rob and Deb Stewart, God rest your soul, you know, really put this, you know, together with Plymouth State back in the day. And this is, has been handed off, Robin, to you and in the connection with Mike and with Matt. And to me, it, it was it was a chunky program of, okay, you've got to wait every other year, and what are you taking in between, and how do you guide the students to the point where now this is a real streamlined program, and it is truly, as Matt said, it's a model for future expansion. It truly is, because now it is something where it saves a ton of money, it meets employer demand. I mean, these 50 folks that are out there, I mean, these are, these are working right here in the North Country. They need uh, this degree. So uh, I think there's really something to be said here. And I, and I thought this was an important one to share this evening because, you know, there are, we're having these conversations right now, the community college system, the university system, how can we work more closely together? How can we partner more? How can we improve access and affordability? And this to me is a, is a template going forward for how we can really achieve all of those things. So uh, the other thing I'll say just while we've, we've got an audience here is Matt has been excellent to work with. Plymouth has been so much fun to work with. They're innovative. They're good to work with as far as trying new things. Uh, and I, I think this is an example. And, and when we say we're looking at other programs, I mean, we're literally having these conversations now. So uh, I think it just, uh, you know, for the future of our students, of our potential students, but really, uh, you know, as far as having a four-year warm handoff partner to be able to say, okay, here are the students and advising them along the way where typically students or just go off into these other large 100,000 student online schools or something and don't get quite that, that personal touch. But also Plymouth State gets our students, right? You're, you're part of the North Country. You're, you know, you, you get our students. So uh, just thank you, Matt, for taking the time. Robin, for you know, being part of this and preparing, but also for all of the behind the scenes work you're doing as well. Uh, so I, we did save some time. I just wanted to see if there are any questions for, for Matt and Robin specifically, and then I'll open it up broader for any wanna, questions. I just want to, if I could just applaud uh, the work that you have both been involved with. This is a great opportunity for our students here. And just speaking of our CT with our teacher ed program, this is a huge win. So I really want to thank you for your work. Um, very exciting. I agree, very exciting. Thanks, Al. And yeah, I mean, over at the uh, the Hugh Gallon over at Littleton has got an excellent program, Robin. I know you've been over there with Matt. That's the, the connection over at Littleton. So uh, just a, an excellent model. And I, I, I agree, Al. I couldn't agree more. And, and when I think of the need for teachers, and obviously this is geared for elementary teachers, is there an opportunity, perhaps that fourth year, uh, to develop uh, home skills for a high school teacher or middle school teacher? Um, because there's huge shortages in that area as well. Just so Matt actually touched on that with the with their fourth year. Some of the students right. are going for that special ed certificate. Right. Um, currently, some of the students that are in the North Country Teacher Program this year are looking at middle and high school social studies and English, and so they will be looking at doing that fourth year in that content area to get those additional credits to allow them for that additional certification. So yeah, we're having those conversations as well. Yeah, and we also have the post-baccalaureate um, science program, science and math certification as well. So if there's a student who wants to take that route, we can absolutely do it. Super. Thanks, Al. Other questions for, for Matt and Robin? I mean, this is, you know, again, this is a program, you know, it sounds like it's a simple program, but I tell you what, there's been a lot of energy and effort put into getting it to where it is. And, and these students have been coming uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday evenings up until about a week ago 
literally in the classroom next door to me, just, you know, coming in and they're a cohort group. So they started, you know, as freshmen, first year students at White Mountains and have really traveled together as well. So they've gotten to know each other. And, you know, that's one of the other added benefits is they hold each other accountable and they check in with each other and they, they help each other through the entire process. So there's also a, a cohort model, whereas a typical transfer student may just show up at a, you know, four year university and say, oh, Jesus, somebody from, you know, wherever, where do I fit? It's that same cohort which, you know, coming out of White Mountains, remember, we have this grad rate and there's a reason for it because of a typically a cohort model and a holding each other accountable. So there's some of that already helping. So I think the success starts there as well and continues on. So if there aren't other questions for Matt or Rob, and I, I'll open up for any questions whatsoever from finance, enrollment, COVID, as much as I don't wanna talk about COVID too much more, I'd be happy to, uh, or anything else at all. What? Uh, really, just kudos to maintaining such a healthy organization through this craziness. So I'll go. Thanks, Al. Yeah, I want to give you all a shout out. Um, you do awesome work at the college, and we're proud to be your partners. Thanks, Julie. And uh, tell you what, you know, Julie, and I mentioned this earlier, but you know, the unsung heroes here of, of Julie and Dave and really all of the, anyone in K-12, Al, I see you and, and others of, you know, they're doing the same thing of shifting back and forth. Are we remote today? Or are we not? And, you know, students and whatnot. So the communication, although we haven't physically seen each other as much, Julie and I probably talk three or four times a week and probably underestimating. Uh, Dave Backler, if you joined the same, uh, you know, we're trying to, you know, we've never managed through a pandemic. So the more good thinking we can get around ideas and running scenarios by each other. If I have a half-baked idea, I'll throw it at Julie and Dave and vice versa. And then, you know, we've got a task force. So I, I think the, the communication, I know I put it as one word on a slide, but communication really has been what this entire process has been about. Uh, and then it's concise, specific communication as well. You know, Julie and I and, and Dave and others, we literally share what we're sending out as communication to our uh, institutions you know, every, every time because we learn something. I'll say, oh, I'll take a piece of that from Julie. That was pretty good. She wrote that really well. But it's important to make sure we get the message across really well. So uh, we've got a, a lot of vetting processes. So Julie, just I wanted to highlight that. Thank you. This has been, uh, it's been good. You know, good way to start every Monday morning with uh, Julie, the Julie and Dave chat. <laughs> it's been grounding. Other questions or comments or anything from our faculty and staff? I see a lot of you on. I appreciate that. Just to, just to be honest, though, Chuck, I do miss the meal. So I know. You'll see a culinary group. I do too. Trust me, I know. I was standing about five minutes before we started. I was standing out talking to Gretchen. I said, wouldn't it be nice if you were walking downstairs right now and all the appetizers were out? And, you know, it'd be easy to say, okay, no questions, go. Uh, no. Next year, or maybe we'll have to do a spring version if we can get through it, I don't know, I'm being optimistic. But no, I, I miss it, but I also want to thank, I mean, we had 50 people here. I, I just appreciate everyone taking the time. Uh, I know you're all super busy and you know you probably just came off of 10 other straight Zoom meetings in a row. So uh, just a super thank you to you. Thanks to my faculty and staff. Uh, you know, this is, uh, this is something that would not be possible without you. And, Trust me, I feel like we're in a really good place for being in the middle of a pandemic. I'm actually overly optimistic uh, from an enrollment, from a financial standpoint, but more importantly, from a people standpoint. You know, the people make the place and not the reverse. And that's what, what makes us so special. And, it, you know, the outcome is really, uh, you know, our students being successful. So uh, another special thanks, Matt, for, for taking the time from Oklahoma State to be with us. And faculty, staff, thank you. And all the elected officials, thank you all very much. And uh, as we continue with uh, any other projects and plans down the road, we'll certainly be uh, looping you in to say the least. So uh, many thanks and uh, we're done even 10 minutes earlier. I'll give that back to you for the evening to go prepare your own culinary meal, Al. And uh, thank, thank you all you. very much, I appreciate it. So have a great evening. Thanks, Matt.